What's going on? Dallas, Texas. Welcome to episode 93, season six of Talk and Throw Podcast, Texas Style. I'm Coach Jason. And I'm Coach Janelle. And before he goes on, I watched, I listened to a podcast today that said most podcasts only make it one season and never make it past like 10 to 20 episodes. We are on episode 93. Mm-hmm. We are above average podcast. Yes, we are. Right. Yes, well, thanks for all the downloads yes. and all the followers. Yes. Appreciate it. Tonight. Yes. And listening. It's why, awesome. Why? <laughs> because you have, when I tell people we have a podcast, they're like, about what? And I was like, even unless you're in the throwing world, yeah. you wouldn't care. But for those people in the throwing world, that's true. We're kind of, well, I don't know. We're kind of a big deal. The guests we have our on the deal. show that's are a big true. deal. That's and true. we get to honor them and highlight them. So, okay, there you go. continue. So, we're track coaches with the <laughs> track club, the Thorn Factory. You can go out to thethornfactory.com to check out our bio. Uh, guys, we have three different coaches, five different coaches, five different locations to fit all your needs. Uh, we're doing a, actually a lot of online and Zoom training and stuff like that. So you don't have to be in the state of Texas. You can be in any state to connect with us and and you know kind of learn how we do it at the Thorn Factory. And uh, we feel like our, our model of technical model and what we do and believing in the kids and coaching kids and, you know, believing in kids and believing in us is at the end of the day, we're having positive impact for the kid, for us and, you know, everybody in between. So if you want to be a part of that, reach out to us, to any of the coaches, and we can get you started in your throwing career. Um, like I just said, we have a, a, a YouTube um, channel as well, so please follow us on there um season six our sponsor without them we can't do what we do texas track and field coach association Stuart Cantor. that website is ttfca.org um if you want to know anything about meet schedule rules um the texas meet of champions that'll be coming in in sometime in may at the texas uh, texas state university go to that website Stuart has done a really good job of putting that website together so Go check that out. And also, too, for those that don't know, Stuart Cantor is also an author. So, two books. So, if you ever need something fun to read, go go buy his books. Fourthrows.com. Quality implements priced right right now if I broke my... Fourthrows.com to get all of your implements. Yes. Okay. And use the code TALKINGTHROWS10 to get 10% off. Um, you can find fiber sports discus there. You can find plantic shot puts there. You can find, find tape measures, cages, javelins, hammer gloves, wires, anything you need, fourthrows.com. Portadass Circle, portadasscircle.com, making throwing more accessible. Use the code TALKINGTOES10 to get 10% off. With the crazy weather we have in the state of Texas, the Porta Circle is a great tool to use on a rainy day in a gymnasium if you're a high school coach or in a hallway where you don't have a throwing ring or if you're at home and you're a parent and your kids are driving you crazy, buy them the Porta Circle, put that Porta Circle in the garage and they can get some really good reps uh, using that porta-circle.com website and use the code TALKINGTHROWS10. Ready Up Athletic Development ran by Zach Phillips. His cell phone is 512-507-8347. Um, you can go find out his new program on the website Train Heroic. Um, the, the, the program is called Basic Throw Strength. Use this code TALKINGTHROWS10 to get 20% off. This program is designed for that multi-fall sport athlete making that transition to track and field. Uh, that website, is, again, is Train Heroic. So if you in the basics of Olympic lifting, the basics of powerlifting, be an explosive athlete for sure. And then also, Power Sports Discus. Putting, looking for a new way to get distance. That website is fibersportsdiscus.com. All right. Let's back up. Okay. Yes, the one K, and you can go to fourthrows.com to purchase. Use that code talking those ten, um, but also too you can go to our website, the, the thornfactory.com, and hit the link, the link to go to the link, the link to uh, get their fiber sports discus as well. And also on our website, you have access to the podcast fourthrows.com and to fiber sports, and then also Big Frogs, Collieville, they handle all our printing. And embroidering. Yeah. 
today's guest, okay, is currently retired after working 44 years in the flooring industry. I'm um, in 1969. He was the state champion um, in the shot put and the national champion in the shot put. In the same year, he threw a lifetime PR in the high school of 68 feet, which ranks still in the top 10 to this day. In 1968, he was a Dallas City champion with a throw of 65 4. Um, and then after his uh, high school, where he graduated at Dallas Sunset, he went on to play football and run track at SMU, where he was a multi-letter went letterman winner, uh, playing for Hayden Fry and also running track there at SMU and throwing it and for throwing as well. So please welcome to the podcast episode ninety-three of season six, Mr. Don Randall. Hello. Hey, there you are. How are y'all? We're well. How are you, sir? I'm oh, doing fine, thank you. We're about to begin here in just a second. So does this lovely lady ask you the first question? <laughs> are you ready? I'm ready, yes, ma'am. Yeah, it, 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 I made that sound like this was like an interrogation. Yeah. <laughs> it is not. This is... <laughs> How many shot puts did you steal? <laughs> It's too heavy to steal too many. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's true. That's true. This is just, you know, we're so honored to have you on and to hear um, your story. So let's go back in time a little bit. Tell us about how did you get into throwing and when did you first start throwing? Well, my story is probably going to be a little different than some, you know, that you've heard before. Uh, I think it started with me in the eighth grade. We had just, uh, we had moved to another school district. Uh, it was just my mother and I growing up, and I was kind of running with a bad crowd. I was getting a lot of trouble. Um, everyone I was running with was getting sent to a foreign school, you know, just really going down the wrong path. She didn't know what to do with me, so we went to another school district. And then the first day of school, they said, if you want to, go out to football, then go in the auditorium afterwards. So I did that, and there was about 200 kids there, and they talked to us, and about 50 is going to make the team. So get an application afterwards. So afterwards, I go up to this coach. He's got this crew cut. He's about 280 pounds. He looks like a bulldog. And here I walk up, and I got these big duck tails, right? You know, I mean, oh, wow. I got this leather jacket, and I got this – silver chain, the beetle boots, tight jeans, you know, I was just, that was me as I was running. He looks me up and down like, what is this poodle I'm doing going out for football? And uh, at that point in time, who would have guessed five years later, this coach and I would be in California and he'd be watching me receive a gold medal around my neck and hear the national anthem played in front of 50,000 people at the Golden West. It was wow. the same coach, you know. So I, I went out for football, and, and you know, and there was kind of a group of kids that grew up together, and nobody really knew me. I was an outsider. And uh, it was in the eighth grade, and uh, never played before, but I did pretty good. They put me at running back. I led the team in touchdowns, led the team in rushing, led the team in tackles, and middle linebacker. Uh <laughs> In fact, we had some tackling drills the first day. They wouldn't let me go through them anymore after the uh, first day. I'd broken a guy's collarbone and dislocated a guy's shoulder on some tackling drills. So they always held me out of those. So football was over, and then, you know, Coach Kidd was his name, and, and he, uh, you know, wanted to develop a track team. So he decided what these athletes, which ones were going to make the track team, what we could do. So one day we were running miles, one day sprints, one day hurdles. One day we get this uh, little iron ball to throw, <laughs> and we all line up to throw that. And there's about, I guess, 50 of us from the football team. I guess I might have I threw maybe I can in 30th, 35th or something, you know. And so, you know, but I like doing it. So I told my mother, I said, you know, I really like this thing throwing the shot put, you know. I guess I was wanting something to latch on to and to do with my life. And I asked her if she could buy me one, and, and she worked downtown, and she had to ride the bus back and forth. And she had about three blocks, or maybe more, from the bus stop. So I remember downtown Dallas. She went to Coleman Borman, bought me a shot put. You know, in the ninth grade, you throw the eight pounds. 
And uh, she carried it home on the bus, carried it home to the house. So I had, you know, my own chocolate. So wow. I had a little ring at the back of the yard. It's about 50 feet, a little over 50. So I made me a little ring, you know, no concrete or nothing. I just measured seven feet. That was the diameter. So yeah. I would stick it in and stick at the end. And then I was throwing towards the alley. There was no fence or anything. It's a concrete alley. And I measured from what the, you know, the tub board would have been. And I measured 50 foot, 11 inches. That was the city, city record. And, you know, I was throwing what, about 34 feet or something. And I wanted to beat that record and break the eighth grade city record. So, you know, I practiced after school. Now to come home and practice and practice on the weekends. And I just threw and threw and threw. And I was getting closer and closer to that thing. And one kind of funny story is, you know, we had this uh, gas meter right by the alley, right by the yard. When I was really getting good, uh, like I say, I had a concrete chalk marker, 50 foot, 11 inches. And I got up there pretty, pretty good, almost hitting the alley. And I hit that gas meter in the air. And the gas, you know, started shooting everywhere. <laughs> that, that was the end of throwing that way. But then I got throwing the other way. And I used <laughs> I used the concrete, uh, and you can do the math, you know, the, the length of seven foot where I could throw plus a little place. So the house is probably 60 foot from the alley, the concrete alley, and it was long enough to make a runway seven foot off of that. And so, but then I, I kept getting better and better. So then I got where the, on a day where it was, you know, not much rain, the ground was hard, the shot would hit the you know, hit the ground, bounce into a house, and you know, all of our siding started falling off, and we had a landlord, and that didn't fire him up too much, you know, he wasn't too happy about that, so that was the end of uh, end of my backyard days, so then Griner, that was my junior high school, they decided they are going to build a shop foot ring for me, because, you know, I was already some potential, so they did build a shop foot ring. Wow. And then that started the problems because we had a video uh, where they watched films and stuff was about 68, 70 feet. And then time I was in the ninth grade going pretty far on, once again, on days where the ground was hard, I hit the ground and it, you know, it's that thing. And so all the people are complaining about that, you know, we keep hearing these loud thuds against the walls, knocking the bricks out and stuff. But we went ahead and kept that, you know, and the shop <laughs> So let's see. So my eighth grade year, I, I was, you know, growing and proving. And then the, the city meet was up and I wanted to, you know, I was in a position to break the city record. And the coach kid wanted me to throw at the ninth grade because we needed the points. And the ninth grade needed the points. He said, the only thing is, uh, if you throw over the city record, you won't have a city record because you'll be as a ninth grade. But we need the points you can earn a letter jacket. A letter sweater. I said, oh, that's yeah. great. You know, so I did that. And he had it figured I'd come in fourth place. And I threw 55-3 that meet. And I won first place in the district. And, of course, he comes across the field, heard about it, giving me a big hug and stuff. And uh, so that's, that was my eighth grade year. And then in the ninth grade, uh, I, uh, you know, worked out all summer. And we did a lot of throwing and some summer track meets. and. I was getting, you know, I was going around 60 feet. So my ninth grade year, I, uh, city record was 60 foot 11 inches. I was already throwing over for that. And then, oh. so we had the city track meet. And this is kind of an interesting story because it was at Cobb Field there in Dallas. It's right by Love Field, right by the expressway and everything. And yeah. oh, we had so much rain. The chocolate ring was completely underwater. And uh, so we had to move. So we threw off this other area. We threw off grass. They just put a ring there. And uh, <laughs> so we had to throw off grass. And then to make matters worse, the terrain was uphill. And, you know, once again, I wanted to break the city record. So you get three throws. And, you know, my first throw was a little over the city record, about 61. My second throw was 63. And then my very last throw, it was my last throw ever with Griner. I know I get ready to throw. And you always kind of look out where you're throwing it and kind of collect your thoughts and everything and what you want to do. And uh, I was doing that. And I remember this plane came over, and I just looked at that plane. I kind of emotional, my last throw ever, you know, so I had a lot of adrenaline. And that throw went 65-4, and that was, the I think, the state junior high record at that time. You know. Wow. 
So no, can I ask I'm, a quick question? I'm, I'm, so how much did the your mama, how much did the shop put cost her when she bought it? Because I'm curious back in those days, do you know the, the price? Well, you know, a 13-year-old kid, we don't keep up with money too much. So okay. Good point, good point. Well, I, I was just curious if you about to do. You know, late, later on, I'll get into it later, but I had the same scenario on my last throw at Sunset. It was at the state meet, you know, and uh, I remember we had a pretty good crowd. It used to be in Austin on the north side of the stadium, and the hall around the fence was crowded in the whole stadium. We had a real big crowd there. And uh, anyway, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. So, That's okay. Uh, That's okay. Do, what? So when you were in the eighth, talking about shot put weights, I'm kind of curious because now eighth grade, you know, most of it is by the district. So some districts have the boys throw six pounds, but other districts in the state of Texas throw uh, a 4K, 8.8. .8. What was the weight of your shot put when you were in the eighth grade? Uh, it was all pretty cut and dry. If you're in junior high, you're going to throw an eight pound. If you're okay. in high school, you're going to throw a 12 pound. Once in college, it's 16 pounds. Gotcha. Okay. So, it was know, basically the same. It was awful, awful heavy to me, but then, you know, if you get used to warming it up or practicing with that, then the eight pound felt lighter. Yeah. So, did, 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 did Coach Kid, did Coach Kid have a background in throwing and kind of give you suggestions on your technique or was it one of those things you kind of crafted on your own working back in the alley so much trying to perfect it and throw farther or did you use well, another resource to learn how to throw technical well i got a lot of loop films and i, I watch form you know i studied form i got like dallas long perry o'brien randy matson mm -hmm. and i just study these and study these see i i don't know I wasn't very big. I was in high school. I was five nine one nine. That's wow. As as I and uh, yeah, so uh, you know, I had to rely on form. I certainly didn't look like a shot putter. I, I lifted weights. I was pretty strong. I had short arms, so I was a strong bench presser. I could bench press four hundred in high school. You know, because uh, you know I, I had short arms and I worked at it. But I just worked on my technique. You know, I throw a hundred times a day. Uh, as I got on into high school and stuff, I started working out with Sammy, Sammy Walker. Yeah. And we became best friends. And, you know, we, you know, we were back to back national champions in Dallas, right back. And uh, we just threw hundreds, maybe 150 times a day, hours and hours, you know, just working on your technique, not throwing for distance, but about 80% about effort and, you know, kicking your left leg up higher, your right. Your right nose almost touched the ground. Mine almost would, and just having a smooth motion. Yeah. So, yeah. and then I did a lot of speed work. I'd work out of the blocks and sprints, 20 yard sprints. Really? Blocks. Maybe, yeah, maybe 20 or 30 a day for explosiveness, you know. Interesting. So that, that's, I worked on my technique. I worked on explosiveness. Uh, just that's, uh, you know, that's kind of. Yeah. How did you first? How did you first meet Sammy Walker, and what was your first impression of Sammy when you did meet him for the first time? It was a summer track meet. I think I was in the eighth, going through the ninth grade. He was in the ninth, going to the tenth grade. He was a big old guy, and you know he didn't throw that far in junior high. But we were at age divisions. Uh, you know, you throw thirteen, fourteen. Sammy was, and he was a senior in high school. He was only seventeen years old. He could have been actually been a junior, been my year, but he was a year ahead of me. He was one of those August kids, you know. So when I first met him, he was at a summer meet, and I think he won it. And we were in different age divisions then. Sometimes we'd be in the same age division, sometimes we wouldn't. But we were in the same, uh, we were in the same different age division. And Coach Kidd was there. He said, You ought to get to know that guy. And he kind of pointed over to that big old guy with Sandy. So I went over and started talking to him. We became friends. He went to Samuel. That's across Dallas. I went to Sunset. So we're yeah. completely across Dallas. So, you know, we on the weekends. I, I, I remember going over to his house most weekends, spending the weekend there. I, I remember lifting weights one, two in the morning. You know, we were just kids, 14, 15 year old, talking about maybe one day, you know, one day that, you know, we just tried, tried to get good, you know, and, uh, yeah. Worked real hard at it, and uh, looking back many years later, it's you know it was it's, it's pretty neat. 
thing I, that I fell into versus yeah. the life I was living, you know. Did Sammy try to introduce you to Olympic lifting back those at 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning? To, to, to what again? I said, did he try to introduce you to Olympic lifting 1 or 2 oh, a.m. Yeah. in used, the morning? Yeah, you, know, you know, we progressed from his garage to the Dallas YMCA. Yeah, okay. So we, that was downtown then off Ross Avenue and – they had all the records there, and Sammy started owning all the records in the heavyweight. And I didn't, I wasn't a heavyweight, I was in a lighter division because I wasn't that big. I told you, I had a lot of records there, but yeah, we did all kind of cleaning jerks and all, all kind of Olympic lifting, power lifting. We even entered some power lifting contests and stuff back when we were 16 and 17 and stuff like that. You know. Wow. Awesome. That y'all were just leaning to the clean life, lifting weights and pushing <laughs> shot putts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we were crazy. Sammy's going through his senior year. And one time we worked out, and it was about four in the morning. We were riding around, you know, and four. We did that all the time. We weren't doing anything bad. We was like riding around and going. Yeah. Through, uh, Cruising. And we got a paper because they had the Golden West invitation on Sammy was going to be in it next year. He goes, oh, my gosh, Carl Saab just wrote Dallas Long's long, long high school chocolate record, 69-6. Just broke wow. the, the national record. Carl Saab was one year ahead of Sammy. Yeah. And, uh, gosh, and then the next year, Sammy broke 70 feet eight on uh, eight different occasions. So, you know, who would have guessed back then that, uh, you know, that us uh, would – Turned out like that for Sandy. For he sure. Had a, he had a fantastic career. For sure. Well, let's go back to your high school career. You know, you you had a pretty nice high school career, your junior, senior year, breaking the city record as a as a junior, you know, throwing the discus 175 feet. Now, I do know Sammy was not the most adept at throwing the discus, but, you know, looking at your record, you seem to kind of – you know, maybe had some sex with some success with it being especially at your size. So how did that transition, you know, from maybe a glide shot putter of learning the rotation, you know, for the discus to throw that far? Well, the discus, the same thing. I, you know, I got loop films of Al order and everybody oh. and watch them throw and just through and through. And you know, you put an hour and a half on the shot, maybe an hour on the discus, you know. We had a summer meet. It was a summer JCAAU meet in Abilene. And the winners got to go to the Nationals in Eugene, Oregon. And it was a great trip, you know. But I had no way I was going to win the shot because Sammy and I, at that point in time, our age were going to the same division. Well, he was going to win the shot. I was going to get second. But lo and behold, that, that, that's a meet that I threw 175 feet in the distance. And I won the distance. So we both got to go to Eugene, Oregon, you know. Oh, and spend, spend some time, you know. What was that your first time traveling on a plane? The first time traveling on a plane was a recruiting trip. It was kind of funny because I heard your podcast with Randy Matson. He said the first time he went on a plane was the USC. And the first time I went on a plane was the University of Tennessee. I wanted to I wanted to become a volunteer and I wrote them and all this. They didn't seem very interested in me. Then my senior year, I'm leading the nation in chocolate. And all of a sudden, I get a bunch of letters, you know, and calls. They want me to come see me, you know. I get a letter. I had a lot of letters when you're leading the nation. Most schools want you to track for them, want you to come. So that was my first flight. I flew out there, and they had the Southeastern Conference Outdoor Championship there in Knoxville. It was a big deal. They had a big dance and dinner afterward with all the alum. They took all the recruits there. And uh, I, uh, I went out there. They had this new surface. You know, everybody ran on cinder then. Cinder track had this new track called Tartan Curve, which uh -huh. everyone knows it now. But that was the first time it was displayed. And there were some fast times, you know, fast times. And then that's that morning. I actually signed a letter of intent with them. You know, they meet you. And they said, well, I said, it looks like I'm going to go to SMU. I said, well, you can sign an SEC letter of intent. That doesn't that binds you to this conference with us, but the national letters May 11. So what you sign there counts. They wouldn't let me out of the office until I did. So I said, okay, I'll go ahead and sign it. You know, so I did sign with them a SEC letter, and then Hayden Fry found out about it, and he wasn't too pleased about that. But you know, he, 
he approached it through some of his assistants and stuff going up to my mother's office and calling me during school and making sure they announced it over the PA. Hayden Fry's on the phone for Don Randall. You know, he was, you know, <laughs> he was, you know. But I, I told him, and it's kind of interesting getting into my college career, I told him that it was really important to me to play both sports. And I wanted to be his commitment, his word, I could do track and football. And and he agreed to that. I said, because that's if I go with Tennessee, they already said I could. They already had some good dual sport athletes like uh, Chip Hell, the Richmond Flowers, who played for the Cowboys, who was a great hurdler. And, and that's kind of why I wanted to go to Tennessee so much. He said, oh, we – he said, that's not our protocol, but we'll do that here for you. You can play football and track. And later on during spring training, after I was starting and the coaches started pulling me away from track, saying, we really need, you know, ran a lot of spring training. I was started. I had to go to Coach Fry's office and just say, you know, said, so, you know, we had an agreement, and uh, he was the athletic director, but he was also the football coach, head football coach. So he was getting pulled in two different directions. You know, he all the football coaches wanted me, but he made an agreement with me. And he, I'll say this, he honored that agreement. You know, I didn't track the football club. Welcome back, track people. This is Brandon, owner of fourthrows.com. We're a fast and growing track and field company that specializes in the throws. With our speed shipping, implement warranties, and rock bottom prices on javelins, discuses, shot puts, and hammers, call us up today to talk directly to one of the owners at fourthrows.com. So did you, just for clarification, at SMU, did you throw shot put at SM2 or just ran track? Did you? I threw the shot. Okay, okay. I, okay. I, I, I was fast in a 40, but after 40, I kind of petered out. I wasn't fast enough to run track, you know. Gotcha. So talk to us a little bit about your throwing career at SMU. Because, you know, being your size, jumping up from that 12-pound to the 16, was that a big adjustment for you? Because talking with some people, you know, like um, David Winkler. David Winkler is, you know, one of the greatest high school throwers of all time in the state of Texas. But, you know, he had trouble jumping up to the 16. I was wondering about yourself. Uh, I threw the 16 in high school about 57, or maybe 58 feet. Wow. I went to a track meet called the uh, Oxcart Relays. It was down in Carn City. Uh-huh. And it was freely into the Southwest Conference Championships. It was their warm-up meet. <clears throat> and I got an invitation to throw in that uh, just as, uh, you know, I didn't get any points or anything. I was still in high school, but all the Southwest Conference guys were there. And I came in second place. Sammy came in first place. And, you know, I said, this, this guy's a senior in high school. He's going to go to SMU. This guy's a freshman at SMU. We're going to dominate the conference, you know. It's a, it's a of course, I had plans by design to play more football on track. But yeah. uh, that, getting back to your question, that was probably the furthest I ever threw. I think I threw 57-9. And then uh, at SMU, a lot of my time was spent during football. I'd go out and do track. But sometimes, you know, I, I still would go through some spring training practices uh, on with pads. You know, I wouldn't go through the whole thing, but sometimes I'd go on with pads and go out. And uh, so it was, it was, I never really got above 58 to 59 feet in college. I think it was about the best I ever threw. And uh, I lettered every year. I mean, you had to get the top four in the Southwest Conference to earn your letter to get the team points. Every year I did place in the top four. But, you know, you think you look at a guy where he's, you know, throwing 58 feet in high school, you think four years later he's going to be throwing 68, you know. Yeah. But, uh, I think what happened with me, to be honest with you, I, I got to this crossroad. If I want to really become a great shot for the world class, I'm not going to be getting taller than five nine. And yeah. I was weighing about, you know, one ninety. I said I'm going to have to weigh two sixty, two seventy. And it might be all muscle or whatever, but I'm going to look like a human bowling ball. And that's the only way I'm going to be world class is to is to get that kind of weight. So you know, I got into football. I was always a good football player. I like the camaraderie of football. Great guys. Some of them, there's a group of us, about 30 of us, that uh, 
you know, we're still in a text group today, 53 years later, you know. Wow. So, uh, you know, real good guy. So uh, I enjoy, I love playing football. It was, I think it was more suited for me, but I'm glad I stuck with track and still able to go out there and contribute well, a little bit to the team and stuff, you know. What was this? Did you play in football at SMU? Because you mentioned I, I, running back I early. I a lineman. Really? Right. Yeah, I played nose guard. And then we, we ran an odd man front, so they had a nose guard uh, where you slant. You know, they wanted yeah. a real fast, quick, short guy, you know, and I fit that thing, so I was perfect for that. And uh, so I, I – uh, we had a red shirt program, and everybody was red shirted, but I didn't get red shirt. I played as a true sophomore. And then my senior year, we had a big shakeup, and uh, we had a uh, – New coach come in from San Diego Chargers by the name of Bum Phillips. Oh yeah, he was our defensive coordinator, so he moved me to right tackle because we went from an odd man front to four three. Yeah, so we had a right tackle, left tackle. He said, you know, there's no stopping anymore. You had to go heads up, and he said, you know, I think you can play that. You might want to try to get a little later over the summer. And I got up to about two ten. That's about as heavy I played at, you know. And uh, my senior year. We're real proud of our defense. We finished number one defense in the Southwest Conference, and we finished number one rush defense that year in the United States. We allowed 43 yards a game. So that was something, you know, we still, as our guys get together, you know, every year. It probably goes down a little. It's probably 58 yards a game every year. (laughs) (laughs) So... Uh, so, you know, I was fortunate in that sense to be a good group of guys and everything. And honestly, I, 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 I remember going to spring football games, red and blue games, playing in them on a Friday in front of a crowd and getting in the car and driving to Austin, Texas, <laughs> and the next morning throwing the preliminary to the Texas Relays, you know. Oh, wow. I, 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 remember, I remember doing that. Wow. What what did it have to be like to kind of set, not maybe even work with him, with Sammy, when Sammy was kind of going professional, you know, going to the Olympics and trying to, you know, be one of those people to possibly win two gold medals as Olympic lifter and a thrower. You know, what was that experience like kind of, you know, sitting beside Sammy, so to speak, watching him go through all that? Well, you know, we like I say, I, I started more football and hang out with those guys. And they had a oh, way okay. he was. We always stayed friends and stuff, but we we didn't quite run in the circles we used to. He ran more track guys. I ran more football guys. And then when he got out, he, uh, you know, he just kept working out, and that was his goal. So he, he would have represented the United States in both events. I think that's the year. Carter canceled the Olympics. He yeah. had made it in weight lifting and shot put. 76, he made it in weight lifting and Olympic lifting. He got ninth in the world up in Montreal, you know. Mm-hmm. So we stayed in touch. It was me. We were just, uh, I still talk to him. I mean, we've been best friends 50 something years, 53 years. Awesome. You know, we, go to, we go to one football game together every year. He had this big golf tournament I played in last year. He sponsored, he does a lot of. Charity work for people. Now, now, do you get free Whataburger anywhere in the state of Texas? Yeah. Yeah, he always gives me a few passes when I see him. I try to hit him up for a few of them Whataburger free Oh, meals. there you go. Hey, hey, give me nothing. Phone. What the hell is this? I said, it's good, you know. Said, well, maybe in Dallas, Whataburger, not here, you know. But, uh, <laughs> oh, uh, that's awesome. That's working awesome. Out with Sam, you know, they, they got to the point that you know, when he started getting, he was 24, 25, and he was still working up the Olympics. So, yeah. You know, yeah. We, we, were, we were still great friends, but we, like I said, our lives were quite different after that. Now, one thing I want to go back to that we skipped over, your senior year, you threw 68 feet, okay? Now, was that at the Golden West Relays when you threw that 68 feet, or was that at a, one of the, the local DFW meets or at a state meet? That was the uh, Texas State Championships. Really? Uh, my very last throw, just like I told you about my junior high. Really? And, uh, it kind of made me proud. I mean, I kind of – it was real emotional. My last throw ever was, was Sunset, and 
And I walked over across the ring, past everything. Everyone's on the fence. There was a huge crowd there. And, I, you know, I, I dedicated my last throw to my mother. I said, this throw, you know, this throw is for you. And I went back there, and that was my best throw ever, just like in junior high, my last throw, my best throw ever. Strange thing about that throw, I've never really told anyone this before. It's true. That throw, if you ever thrown the shot, you know, it's a combination of a good glide, good slide. And it all ends with the perfect release. You've got to let that your finger really get into the shot and release it. And even when it throws a shot, sometimes it'll get a good release and it kind of comes off your side. We call those slipsies. Everybody's yeah. had. And uh, I've had slipsies, and I've never thrown more than 60, 61 feet of a slipsie because you just don't. Well, that last throw of mine was a slipsie, and it went 68 feet. Really? And that's the truth. So help me God. <laughs> and wow. I don't know what would have happened if that would have been a perfect or good release, you know. Oh, wow. But it went the right yeah. way. My last throw, and uh, I, you know, dedicated to my mom, and I was I won the state championship by about six feet. At the Golden West, I didn't throw that far. I threw about 64 something. I just, this was a month after the state beat, you kind of lose your momentum there. Yeah. I did, and I didn't train real hard either. I don't know what, uh, what I was thinking. I think I thought I was Bill Nano for something at the time. I, <laughs> I was lucky to win it. I won it on my last throw. And uh, I just wasn't really prepared for that meet, you know. And yeah, just being a young kid, not being very smart, you know. I was smart most of my career. I just the Golden West it was like it was all over with. It was such a big gap. But I, well, I would say something one neat about the Golden West, though. I was out there and I had an interview the first day I was there, and they wanted me with this little distance runner. They said, "Y'all are both kind of small." overachievers so we had this interview together and this little old distant runner small little guy said well what what do you want to do he said well i wouldn't mind a beer you want to grab a beer i said sure so we went to this hotel beer anyway we hung around together the whole time became good friends his name you might know his name was steve prefontaine wow <laughs> yeah he was a senior when I was a senior, and they made a movie. He made a, they made a movie about him. Yeah, yeah. Well, we got to be really, Fontaine Mile. We got to be pretty good buddies because we're both kind of small. We're both kind of I shouldn't be saying this, but we both kind of like to drink beer at kind of an early age, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> kind of cool, you know, I thought. Oh, that's awesome. One, one guy. Legendary. You've got, been blessed to meet a lot of great people over your life. You, you've The Lord has put you in the path of a lot of great people from Hayden Fry to Bum Phillips to Stevie Walker, uh, you know, or Sammy Walker, excuse me, uh, to Prefontaine. That has to be pretty amazing life. Yeah, I mean, honestly, you know, I've been real blessed. And I'm, what you said is true, very true. And I'm very thankful for it. My life didn't have to turn out so good you know like I say I, I was getting in quite a bit of trouble you know but uh it was pretty neat some of the people you met the trips I've taken a guy that got third in the shot put uh that year was uh considered by many the greatest offensive lineman to ever play the game in the history of the NFL he played for the New England Patriots John Hanna everyone's heard of him and He's a, considered the greatest lineman ever, and he got third in the shot, but, you know. Wow. I was up in Boston one time, and I, I was my son. We were visiting, and I go to this sports place. They have a John Hanneberger and all this stuff. And told him the story that, yeah, I was with him at the Golden West. We are national together for seven days. We spent a lot of time out there. They took us to San Francisco Zoo one day. We were out there a long time, you know, and, Wow. Got to know Hannah pretty well. I said, oh, yeah, I got to hang up with him. And I tell you, I never touched my pocketbook. The manager would come over, listen to a few of my stories, you know. And I hated to tell him. They said, well, how 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 you doing the shot? I hated to tell him that, you know, well, I beat him because they wouldn't probably believe it, you know. So I, I just said, uh, I said, well, we just, we had a lot of fun together, you know. And I'd pick up my meal and stuff, you know. So it was nice. <laughs> 
That's awesome. Don, I got, are you aware, are you aware that your 68 is still ranked in the top 10 all time currently in the state of Texas? Not really. You're not. Sammy sent me some years back and he said, yeah, I was number seventh in the nation all time. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how old that was. That kind of shocked me. I have noticed over the years, I don't keep up with it a whole lot, but at least that shot putters, the, the distances didn't really go up like they times went down, broad jumps, pole balls went up. It seemed like shot putting just didn't really escalate. Yeah. On the same level that other events did, you know. Yes, sir. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I didn't know it, but I'm glad you told me. And, yeah. Uh, There's been a, a couple of big shot putters the last couple of years that's went. 65, 66, 60, you know, um, did Bryce go 70? I don't Ooh, think, I don't, I don't think so. Oh. Yeah, you, but you're still hanging in there in the top 10. It just goes to show what you did in all the training in the alley and, you know, and the, oh the, the, that mindset to break a record and, and kind of that relentless approach to be able to handle that attitude. And you're, de you're definitely right. The, the numbers are dropping. I wish we had an answer of why. Um, uh, maybe we're not doing a good job of coaching. <laughs> but, but you know, what you did back in those years, man, is is needs to be applauded and be proud of what you did because especially at five foot nine, 190 pounds to throw that damn far, I, I'd have loved to see that. So, yeah, well, it's funny, you know, my junior high record at Griner, of course, that still stands. It's oh, right. Funny. All these records, 2000, where are we in now? We're in 23, I guess. 2022, 2020. Here's, oh, here's a 2018 record. Oh, my. And then you go down 1966, you know, 65 feet. What? And my sunset record, I guess, will know it stand because they put sunset as a, as a Dallas landmark shrine. And it'll never be knocked down. Sunset will always stay. I doubt he was going to beat that record there. So I guess that record is going to be there a long time. Yeah. You know, maybe somebody will come along from, you know, there's 10,000 high schools in the, in the country. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe someone will come along and beat that from that high school, but I kind of doubt it. So do you, kind of do, you, do you still keep up with throwing what currently is going on in the U.S. or even, you know, in the state of Texas? Do you still keep up with – you know, some popular people like Ryan Krauser, Valerie Almond. Are you keeping up watching kind of from a distance? Uh, well, I mean, not really high school and all that. Of course, Ryan Krauser, of course, you know, being a shot putter like I did and seeing guys throw, you know, 75 feet or whatever he throws it. I'm aware of that. I did listen to your podcast with Randy Matson. You know, he was kind of my idol growing up and, uh, my 68 feet were beat his state record. It was second of all time at the time, and that was something I was really proud of because uh, I, I never really met him. I think he called a few of our track meets when I was in college, you know, like yeah. triangular meets we have at A&M. He would run off the shot, and, uh, you know, he was he was always my idol. You know, I remember in the ninth, ninth or tenth grade throwing in an indoor meet. He was throwing in it there and uh, it was at the livestock building there in Dallas. They made a big indoor arena out of it. You know, he was he was kind of like I say, he was my idol. Wow. Well, he's a lot of people's idol for sure. Yeah, he was sure. fun yeah, to you know, He brought the first one to break seventy feet, and they put that shot put ring at Kyle Field in the middle of the field. And he did that. I think he was on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Yeah, it was a big deal, and then my friend Sammy was the first high school guy to break it. Yeah, that's awesome. It was so funny. I just got to tell you, it was the very first track meet of the year, and it was at Carrollton, Texas. And it's a funny story, but you know, he just went off and had that great throw, and they measured it. And the guy who measured it was a guy named Russell Paul Hemus, who Coach Kidd hired as an assistant at Sunset. To help me, he wasn't much of a help, but that's not the story. But it was a cloth tape, and that thing measured about seventy foot two inches. Paul Hema stretched that thing and pulled it and pulled it and stretched it. I guess he thought he was going to really almost broke it. He got it down to 69, 11 and three quarters. He goes, "That's it." So 
officially speaking, that was Sammy's first track meet. Didn't break 70. It was 69, 11, and three quarters. <laughs> I don't think we're going to get anything. No. Just, uh, we try to pull the tight like that. Uh, yeah. But then uh, I guess it motivated Sammy because out of the last, the next nine track meets, eight of You know, it wasn't a big deal in hindsight. Yeah. You still can you can you hear us? Yeah. Can you can you hear me okay? You're yeah, we can hear you now. Freezing up, freezing up a little we're, bit. There. Yeah, we're freezing up a little bit. So 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 you graduated from SMU. What degree did you get from SMU and, and what's what happened after SMU? To play a little uh, pro ball, that USFFL kind of fit me out as far as 5'9", you know, 210 pounds. It wasn't a big market for those kind of linemen, you know. Yeah. Well, uh, I got my degree and went into, went into sales, and I was in the same industry as a sales rep for 44 years. <laughs> doing the same thing. I was a manufacturing rep, you know, in the flooring industry. Uh, I was sent out in West Texas for 14 years. So I lived in Lubbock for 14 years. And uh, those were good years. And I moved to San Antonio about 30 years ago. And then you know, I've been down here. So you know, I love to go to football games and stuff. I haven't been to too many track meets. I'm not walking too great these days. I got knee replacements. Few years back, uh, 2016, and I've had the same knee's been replaced three times, and I've had 13 operations on it. Oh, wow. it keeps getting infected, you know. So I, I can't, I don't walk all that great anymore. I swim a lot, you know. I prefer water over land any time. <laughs> I swim <laughs> three to four hours a day, you know. I'm comfortable in the water, and that's what I do now. I, I swim a whole lot. So nice. I love to. I used to play tennis and racquetball and all that, but you can't do that when you're hard to walk. You're not going to be able to do that very well. I so. feel your pain. <laughs> so, you grandkids, kids, um, did you ever get married? Uh, yeah, I've got three kids. Uh, Rusty's my oldest. He lives in New York. He's doing real well. And Robin's out in California. And then Justin's my youngest. Justin was a real good athlete. He played tennis. He was uh, uh, always top five in the state in his age group in, U in USTA, United States Tennis Association. We traveled a lot all over the state with some national meets. So he played collegiate tennis at UPT. So he was a good nice. tennis player. And uh, I used to like to play him until he got beaten me real bad. And I didn't like playing him much after that. <laughs> Some strange reason. <laughs> For sure. Awesome. For sure. So any grandkids? Uh no. No. Okay. Gotcha. No. Gotcha. Gotcha. Understand that. So well, good. So you're just retiring, doing a lot of swimming, living in San Antonio, correct? Yeah, I play a little golf, you know, as long as it's a park, you know. I'm not very good with this leg, but I wasn't very good with before I had this problem with my leg. At least now I got an excuse, you know. Yeah. Like, but I'm not a very good golfer, but I go out there. I might make a par now and then. So I play a little golf. and I love to swim and just to kind of enjoy retirement. I play a lot of pinball. I don't know how we're going to bring that up during this podcast. But I guess when I was a kid, you know, with the misspent youth, I played a lot of pinball now. 50 years later, I guess I think I'm supposed to play pinball again. I don't know. Well, there you go. I go play pinball one day and I swim four hours the next day and, you know, try to do something all the time, you know. Busy. I love so, it. So when's the last time you've been back on SMU campus? Well, we go back every year for a football game. Oh, you do? Okay. All the guys get together. We have a text group called the Wild Mustangs, about 35 of us. They'll probably all be listening to this when I tell them about it. Nice. We all get together, and then I got a couple of high school buddies. I uh, get with them once a year, and we go to an SCBU game. Nice. Uh, one of them, but he was a 35-year uh, pilot for Exxon Corporation. He just retired. He's their head pilot. 
and uh, the other guy lives in Houston. So we get together and I go to one football game a year with them and then try to go one to a football game a year with my buddies, you know. Nice. We all had a little get a little reunion and all get together and do that. Nice. God, the campus has changed so much. You know, I was there recently this year and we had to park here and get a ride. Thank goodness those little carts come around and give you a little ride back and forth. Mm-hmm. But uh, we watched the SMU play TCU of all people. Oh, wow. <laughs> TCU of course, had a great year this year. Yeah. So, so you're up? Are you upset at Sunny for uh, leaving SMU and going to TCU? Uh, a lot of people are. I'm not because you know I understand coaches. That's their job to better themselves. And uh, but there are a lot of people real upset at Sunny. You know, but you know he saw an opportunity. Uh, the big thing, I think, was the fact that they play in the Big 12 and SMU's not going to get in the Big 12. Yeah. Know? Looks like now we might get in the Pac-12, but as we do that, the Pac-12 just assembling and crowning right in front of our very eyes. So I don't know if the Pac-12 is going to be for you. Know? Yeah. It looks like we have an opportunity to go to the Pac-12. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I have to ask this. That'd be a strong you can answer it if you want, because, you know, being a, a athlete alumni from SMU, as you're aware, aware of the, the men's track program was stopped, you know, probably a little after the time. Well, I can't even remember when it was 80 something, 79. Yeah. So that that kind of had to kind of be a, a bad taste in your mouth when that happened. Right. The track program was stopped. Yeah. The men's side. Yes, sir. Gosh, I'm not sure I knew that. I saw Michael Carter throw there. I thought that was in the – when was that, in the early 80s? Or yes, sir. Like yeah, it was 80 – yeah, 80, 84. Then I think the track – the men's side track stopped in when, – when Woolman was there in 88 because that's like when um, – I don't know if you know the name, but uh, Hannes Hopley, he was still training there, just won the, the national championship in the NCAA in the discus. Um, and he just broke the national record um, for the high, for the collegians in the discus that the year before, or something like that. So uh, uh, budget uh, cut uh, for SMU because uh, you know they y'all brought on t- soccer and Title Nine and all that type of stuff. So they had to cut something, and the men's track team was cut. Yeah, yeah, I, I kind of ringing the bell now. I know they got a lot of good white men for a while. Michael Carter went there. And- one of the yes, NCAAs, and him and Sammy have a pretty good connection there. Yeah. I went to uh, Baton Rouge and watched him throw there uh, this one year when I was out in West Texas. I just threw out there. My best buddy, one of my best buddies, Mike Marks, he got second in the state with me and he got fifth at the national. He was coaching out there at the University of Alabama. He was a drink coach. Oh, wow. Had the big nationals there at Baton Rouge. He wanted to come stay with the team, you know. So I flew out there and stayed there at the LSU campus. And uh, Mike went on to, uh, he coached at North Carolina. He just retired. He coached with Matt Brown there and he coached with Bear Bryant. Took me in Bear Bryant's office there once. I thought that was pretty cool. When I nice. in there. But he got second in the state, and he got fifth in the national. And, wow. So he had a pretty good shot. But he went to Oklahoma State, and he couldn't uh, play football because his knee was bad. So he did track, and he got up over 60 and 16 at Oklahoma State. I think he still holds the Oklahoma State shot record. Oh, I wow. So awesome. he's, he's, one of, he's, he's one of my real good buddies, too. Uh, do you still – so tell us, the Coach Kidd. Is he still with us? Is he passed away? Do y'all still have a relationship? Uh, well, he's not with us anymore. You know, we uh, went through eighth and ninth grade together. And he was a junior high coach, and you know, and I was going to go on to Sunset. And we went to this summer track meet out in Lubbock, you know, one summer. And he was there with me and riding the bus back from Lubbock to Dallas is a long ride. And I know we stopped at the toll booth to get out, and, you know. This was in August, I guess. And I know it must have been in July. Coach Kidd says, well, I got some bad news. He says, you're going to have to put up with me for the next three years. I just took a job uh, at Sunset being a coach there. <laughs> of course, I gave him a big hug. I couldn't get my arms around him. He's so damn big, but I gave him a big <laughs> hug. 
So, you know, he he really wasn't a coach. I mean, he was a, just a great. He didn't really know the intrigues of the shot, but, I mean, he'd come up every day and watch me play. He'd say, get a little more height. You need to get a little more height, you know. <laughs> so, every said to me. But he, he knew I could do it myself, you know, and stuff. And uh, so we went through all those years together, junior high and then high school, and then we got to go to the nationals together. And uh, that was real neat. And like I say, he, uh, we kept up a little bit afterwards, you know. He, he was just really a big influence in my life, and I was kind of fortunate to uh, – run across him, you know, I'll never forget. I still, I still shudder when I see him look at me, you know, 53 years later, he's looking down at me like, what is this kid doing trying to go out to football, you know? <laughs> I can't blame him. I was a bad kid, you know. I hated running wind sprints. I was smoking cigarettes back then, and well, I couldn't do the wind sprints. I run about three or four of them. I can't do this shit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I got – I finally quit that bad habit and got in shape, you know. There you go. There you go. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely stop smoking for sure. Well, Don, thank you so much. What a great story. What a great inspiration. Mm-hmm. And and you're, you're why we do this podcast. So we are so ecstatic to get your story out there and, and share it with the world. And, um, man, just thank keep you. living. This was a real pleasure, a real honor, really, and uh, – We've got the people you've had on this show, I don't even, you know, fall in their category by any any means. But it was it was me being on it, and you know, my story is a little different. I'm I was a little fortunate, and uh, it's kind of nice sharing it. You know, I may fire somebody else down the road. Who, who knows, you know, absolutely. Well, sir, you're as long as you're in the top ten, you're going to get recognition in the state of Texas because. Mm-hmm. If a, um, a guy that smokes cigarettes at five foot nine, 180 can throw 68 feet, by God, you're going to get some credit. <laughs> because nowadays, I'll be honest, I just went to a meet last week and there's kids six foot five, 300 that can't even throw 45. And Don, you're just like, God almighty, what is the world coming to? So <laughs> well, I got to tell you one thing before we go. You'll like this story. All those years, Sammy practices and everything. I never beat him in practice, not one time, okay? But about uh, when I was in Lubbock, I bought this house, had a pretty big backyard and had this pretty big and I had this porch that was, you know, patio, pretty big concrete. So I got this little eight pound shot put and started throwing it, you know? This was 1981. So what am I now? 30 years old, you know, I'm old, but still, you know, still pretty good shape, played a lot of racquetball. And I was throwing that shot, and I enjoyed doing it. You know, I was throwing the shot and the distance. I was throwing distance over 200 feet. It was a junior high distance, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and I was throwing the shot pretty far. So I was in Dallas one time. I get in Dallas a lot because we had sales meetings there about once a month. And I said, Sammy, let's go out and throw the shot, you know. And he was still working out. I said, let's go out and throw the shot like old times sake. So he had a shot put ring in his backyard, you know. So we went out through the shot, and that's uh, that's the only time I ever beat Savvy because I'd been practicing and stuff. <laughs> and he swears he still talks about that. He, you know, I don't remember the only time I ever beat him, and it was you know way after his Olympics was over and way over every every everything was over. But uh, you know. Yes, that's funny. That's a great that story. A great story. That is awesome. Well, good. I will definitely let Sammy and other people know that you did beat him. <laughs> Wait a minute. It's out there for the world. It's out there for the world. You know, yeah, he, one, one time. It, and it wasn't laser taped or anything like that, so it's official. <laughs> oh, yeah. And also, I think we had a few beers before we threw it out. <laughs> for sure. Love it. Well, Don, thank you so much. God bless you. If you ever need anything from us, let us know. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. I sure enjoyed the opportunity. Appreciate it. God bless you, sir. We would like to thank Mr. Randall for being on episode 93. What a super cool story. Sum it up. Track safety. His mama is, I know... And how thankful that she moved him to a different school 
and that he walked up and signed up to track with Coach Kidd, well, for football with Coach Kidd, and then went out and started throwing. Because as you heard, he his, path, his life was not going down a path that he wanted it to go down, and he found his passion in track and built his own ring in his backyard and was throwing in the alley. So he don't have any excuses. He found a way and then threw and hit the house and uh, he found a way to and find I just, a path to help him. In that time, it, when he was talking lunch, about that yeah. work ethic, work ethic and just putting in the time and effort to go do something. Today we have social media. We have a everything lot of distractions. on and all these distractions. Yeah. And, but it goes to show you when you want to go do something and throwing is what you put into something is what you go get out of it sport and he worked his butt off and he was able to have you know great success early on when he when he didn't fit the mold of being five foot nine and 190 pounds yeah and so just just a great story you know track has carried a lot of different paths for him and great story and Still to this day, 68 feet ranked in the top 10 all time is just really amazing considering his size, but just technology and everything that's happened over the years that, hey, it's a result. Kids that want to put in the effort, the time to really get better are going to get the results just like he did in 1968 and 1969. And even today in 2023, when he said he swims several yeah. hours a day and he was playing golf, so he, he's still active. just a driven, active guy who is not knee replacements whatever he could be sitting around the house you know being old and he's not for sure not so for sure so the story was awesome and we'll put it on the record again he beat Sammy Walker yes at one time Sammy at one time that one time in, in the back of his Sammy's house backyard that's kind of sad Sammy you got beat and you had whole film advantage I you know what's going on there? So, so did y'all did y'all measure the shot put before y'all waited in? Sammy watches this. Yeah, for sure. For sure. We appreciate you, Sammy, for being on our podcast. Also. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you guys for all the people who are downloading and subscribing. Man, please continue to do that. We want to thank our sponsors, Texas Track and Field Coaches Association. Go to ttsca.org. And um, we're in the heart of high school track season here in Texas. Um, so go look at all the meets coming up. Man, go watch somebody throw. If you're, I don't know, if your grandpa new to this and your kids started throwing, man, get out there and watch. Listen to some of these podcasts. Get plugged in to this track world and into the throwing aspect of it. Um, fourthrows.com, quality implements priced right. Use the code TALKINGTHROWS10 to get 10% off. If you're looking for any kind of implement to throw, um, these guys will treat your eye. Port a circle, port a dash circle. Um, use the code TALKINGTHROWS10 to get you a port a circle. Like um, Coach A said earlier, put it in a garage. You can put that thing anywhere and figure out how to throw. You know, Don said that one meet they had to throw in the grass. Mm -hmm. That may not happen now. That was in the 1960s. But still, yeah. if you practice with a porter circle, you know, you, no excuses, right, if you want to get better. Ready Up Athletic Development, go to readyupad.com. Or if you're in the Austin area, call Zach Phillips, 512-507-8347. Um, follow him on Instagram, on his social media, and see all the great things he does. And then if you're looking for a program, um, go to Basic Throws. I'm sorry, go to Train Heroic and find his program, Basic Throw Strength, and use the code Talking Throws 10 to get your 20% off. And then we want to thank um, Big Frogs of Colleyville for all their uh, new hats, all their, all their stuff they do for us. Hello, Talking Throws Texas podcasters. I'm Bruce Caldwell. I'm here today to introduce the Fiber Sport Discus. Yes, many of you thought I only made great vaulting poles. I have been bringing quality discuses to the thrower's hands for over 40 years. First as Cantabrian USA representative, then for the past 10 years as the Nelco discus distributor. I introduced the yellow plated discus for the plastic's dur best durability. If your fiber sport discus breaks, we replace it. Our studies have reached into the science of using a wind tunnel and adding microchips to the discus to find the spin, the gravity, the flight stability of the discus. We have found it's not about rim weight anymore, it's more about creating a balanced stability to allow the discus to fly and surf the wind. 
Our new Fiber Sport Discus is made to be selected to fit your needs, no matter the weather, no matter the conditions. Check out our discus selection guide at FiberSportDiscus.com and find a dealer in your area that sells our fine product. Thank you, Jason Janelle, for allowing me to talk with your listeners on Talk and Throws Texas Style. And then the Throwing Factory. We're doing lessons right now. you got a middle school kid who's tried out, made the team, um, but really actually wants to make it to a meet. Give us a call. Right? We would love to do some lessons with them, do some online things. If you're not anywhere near where we live in Texas, give us a call. We can do some Zoom lessons. There's probably just a few things you need to tweak to help you get that distance to reach whatever goal that you may have um, for this year. Lifting DFW. Mm-hmm. Right. Human performance. So if you're needing some Olympic lefts- lessons, um, whether you're a high school athlete, a parent wanting to get in shape, just being introduced to Olympic uh, Olympic lifting can help you in so many ways for different sports. So uh, if you have questions, contact me. Go to that website, uh, Lifting DFW. Um, and we have a lot of new information on that site, site as well. So go check that out. And if you have any questions, just give us a holler. Thank you so much. Yes, and please subscribe to the podcast and to the YouTube channel. Yes. Right, give us some feedback, right? Like, the change shouldn't be so loud or something like that. Yeah, yes. yes. All right, y'all have a great day.